Um, it's a real pleasure to be up here to introduce this film and this filmmaker. Ingrid Veninger is an actor, producer, and director. She's produced films like uh, Peter Mettler's Picture of Light, uh, uh, Gambling Gods and LSD, another Peter Mettler film, uh, which went on to win a genie. I think one of the best documentaries ever made in this country. Uh, she's uh, been featured in many, starred in many films, lots of TV series. She was in Anais Gronofsky's On Their Knees, and uh, one of my favorite films of the last 10 years, Rob Stefanik's Phil the Alien. Uh, she also produced uh, Anais's second film, The Limb Salesman. This is her second, well, this is her first film as a uh, solo director, but her, uh, she, she did a film called Only, which she co-directed a couple years ago uh, in a similar vein. This is a beautiful film, uh, lyrical, uh, very realistic, a little bit, I think in some ways, like a, kind of a teenage version of Before Sunset, the great Richard Linklater uh, American independent film from the 90s. Um, it is, it is an exquisite film, and one of the great things about it is the way it captures the way teenagers really actually interrelate, the way they speak to one another, the way they think. Uh, also a great, uh, great portrait of uh, Slovakia, uh, and really one of the most beautiful films uh, I've seen in a while. And of course, it's a Canada's top 10 selection as well. Please join me in welcoming the filmmaker, Ingrid Vanninger. Thank you, Steve. Um, Tiff Bell Lightbox is not this an incredible building that we have in our city. How many people are here for the first time? A few people are here for the first time. I'm just, I'm just blown away. I saw a film here last night, and um, I'm just going to be living here for the next ten days. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about Modra because I'm going to have some time with you after the screening. But I want to dedicate today's screening to taking risks, like um, taking creative risks, really. So let's say over here is where you know what you're doing. And um, over here is where you don't know what you're doing, which is not so great. But there's this really juicy, great, creative place in between that's very exciting. And I want to dedicate the screening today to that spot. And I'll see you after. Thank you. Stick around. We'll be back. Quest question was whether, uh, when you were writing the film, whether it was part of your background, did you have family roots there? Yeah. Do you want a yellow or a blue button? <laughs> um, I like yellow. Excellent. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. What's your name? And where, where are you from? And you're studying film? No, I'm not. I volunteer work for a Okay, cool. Excellent. Um... I was born in Bratislava. I'm a little bit winded. Just ran from the washroom, hold on. Out of shape. Um, I was born in Bratislava and uh, I came to Canada with my parents in 1968. I was two years old and my father had been in prison for five years, so as the Russian tanks rolled in, we had to get out quite quickly and so the family was literally broken. And the first time I returned, I was 17. Um, and so everyone you see in the film is real family, except for the boys that Lena meets. Everyone else is real family. Right there. Question was about uh, when you introduce a character, you go to a it's still shot, right? It's a it's like well, not a still shot. It's like a still shot. It's a uh, what 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 was the uh, how did that develop? What was the reasoning for that? Yeah, like the the portraits. Well, really, growing up. An only, I'm an only child. Growing up in Toronto, um, I always dreamed about having a big family. And I knew I had all these relatives in Slovakia, but I never knew them. And um, sometimes they would send photos. My parents would exchange photos. And my mother collected these photo albums. And so my only real relationship to my family was through these pictures and albums. And often they were these portraits. So when I came back for the first time at 17, I was, I almost flashed on the, the photo album picture of them each time I was meeting a new relatives. So it was kind of like, yeah, that's the way I wanted to introduce the audience to, to, these, to these family members is the way I remember kind of being introduced to them through these snapshots and these portraits and these photos. Yeah, but I ha I'm happy you got that feeling because it's interesting to me, um, how people sort of journey through the film 
through Lena's character and then how they journey through Leko's character and then when the sort of alliances shift, like when you have more sympathy for her and then when it shifts to having more sympathy for him and, you know, he does some doggy things but sh she does some things that are kind of questionable too. So it's interesting to me that you sort of felt like you were, you were, you were meeting the family through his eyes. That's cool. Next, right there. Question was, what inspired you to write the film? Was it entirely based on that that trip to Slovakia? Um, well, as Steve mentioned earlier, I had made a film called Only, and it starred my son. And it was exploring that in between age of 12, when you're no longer a kid, but you're not quite a teenager. And the age of 17, I think, is a really interesting time because you're sort of through the sweet 16, but you're not quite 18. And it's this limbo time, and you're dealing with a lot of things for the first time. And so you don't have all these reference points for, you know, relationships and all these desires and these yearnings outside yourself. And um, coincidentally, my daughter uh, was 17, and she's here today, and she plays the lead role. So I'm going to bring her up. Hallie Switzer, come on up here. Um, and uh, so she's 17, now she's 18. But living with a 17-year-old, um, I guess I kind of knew that this was like we were entering our last year of living together. She was going to go into her last year of high school. She was then going to travel or go to university. And it was, um, I wanted to make something with her um, that was exploring where she's at. And so, you know, her being 17 made me think of my own 17 and that became the sort of groundwork for the story. But um, I just mainly really wanted to create something with her as a kind of, um, as a way for me to maybe let go of her as she kind of went into her life, you know? And, uh, and it was a really cool experience. No one in the film had ever acted before. Everyone um, is acting for the first time. Uh, and so they, it was very, they were very courageous. And I rehearsed with the two actors for about three months before we started shooting every weekend. But in that rehearsal pro process, I was writing the script and I was, I was changing things a lot to kind of write for them more specifically. Um, but I was writing for about a year before we started shooting. Uh, right there. The question was, a uh, gentleman said sometimes when he's shooting uh, material, you sometimes get overwhelmed with the flow, and whether, he asked whether you have a specific pattern, like you're an establishing shot, that kind of thing. Um, I started acting when I was 11 years old, and so everything I know really comes from being an actor and working with really good directors and really creepy directors and really strong cinematographers and real like terrible cinematographers, I think, that kind of move me around. And um, in for this film, I really wanted the process of making the film to feel like being 17. So at times it was really, really chaotic. And it kind of goes back to my dedication at the beginning of the film. Um, so every film for me is different. My approach to shooting is different. In this case, I had words, and I developed words with the cinematographer um, of things that I really want, of how I really wanted the film to feel and how I didn't want it to feel. So in the beginning, we really wanted it to feel kind of choppy and fragmented and erratic and kind of, you know, um, you know, like 17 can kind of feel fumbly, like you're not really grounded. And then as they get sort of more rooted in themselves, the, the feeling and the flow and the shots get a bit longer and everything starts to feel a little bit more fluid. So I think I don't have a pattern, I don't really have a formula, but every story, um, every actor that I work with informs how I shoot it. I start with, I start with the story and how I want that story to feel on the screen and what I want the audience to get from the shots and from the compositions and how the camera moves. And then I really respond to the actor. So I may go into a day of shooting with a plan, but as soon as I see how the actors are moving around a space, I throw away the plan and I respond intuitively and um, in the moment to how the actors are, 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 organically kind of um, making the scene work. I respond to that. But I think, I think just, 
I was just going to say, I think just technically, in most cases, there'd usually be three variations on a shot, right? Like, like there'd be like a two shot, a close up and a wide, you know, like, yeah, sometimes I would, I would cover it, but there were a lot of um, one shot, there were a few one shot things. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, I would have an idea of a one shot. um, And I had to be very, very careful. This is a tricky thing as a director, I think. And I would have a one-shot idea, and the cinematographer would get very excited by it. And, I mean, my whole crew was one sound man, one cameraman, myself. That's the whole crew. Uh, So we were very small. We could be very flexible. But I think it's really important not to let the idea get in the way of the discovery. So we would get really excited about one shot. Like, we had the the scene in the mirror bar where the guy asks her to dance. We shot that for one whole night in one shot. And it was really cool and fun to do, but it was bullshit. I'm sorry, it was total bullshit. It was total conceptual idea over top of content. So we scrapped it and we sh- reshot it. So I think that's, that's it's such a, because you fall in love with your idea, you know, but when it's not true, you can, you can feel it. You have to be really awake to feeling when it's when it's sincere and when it's um, you know an intellectual kind of indulgence. Question was about the cutaways and whether they were planned or whether it came out in the how the, how they came about. Um, do you mean like the the shots going from night to day and the shots of the speakers with the announcements and that those kinds of cutaways? Yeah. Um, no, they were not in the script. Uh, I would say that was kind of the DP and myself responding to the space we were in because those announcements kept interrupting our shooting. So they would, we'd have to stop rolling and these announcements would play like three, four times a day. And they literally would be, you know, someone lost their keys or, you know, there's a poetry reading in the square. Like, um... But then I decided to incorporate it, and it started to really mark time because the announcements would start every day. They'd go at 6 in the morning, 8 in the morning, 11, and then if there was news, the news would be repeated at 4 and at 6 and at 8 p.m. So then that developed just out of being in the space. So the portraits of the family were always in the script. The speakers were not. Um, and the, you know, the morning shots and the night shots were not. Um, and I would say that's a little bit of also, uh, you know, looking at coffee table books of Slovakia. Again, it was sort of this picturesque, almost fairy tale village in my mind when I was 17. And I wanted to preserve that. You know, some people in Slovakia where we showed it said that's not really what it's like. Like there's gypsies and there's crime and there's mafia and there's a whole bunch of there's crazy alcoholism and homeless people and um, orphanages and everything. But when I was 17, that wasn't my deal. That wasn't my perspective. And so I, re- I really wanted to not impose my present day and everything I know about my family and everything that's going on there, my present day perspective on this film. I wanted it to have an innocence. And so those little detached cutaways is kind of preserving this the idyllic, fro- almost frozen in time village that I remember. At the back there, question was about why why use a handheld camera? Was it related to budget, or was it a, an aesthetic decision from the outset? It's never really one or the other, is it? For for me, it's like budget affects cre- like I write. I know I have three credit cards with a certain limit, so I write the script to that scale, and I know I have. I don't have money for excess baggage, and. You know, it was really crazy, like, to rent equipment there. Um, you know, if I wanted to rent lights, then the then the equipment house insisted that I use one of their electricians. So suddenly that person was getting, like, union rates. And it was just impossible, you know, and to bring things over from Toronto became a bit... So I wanted to be light and easy and flexible and, to, and, be able, and I wanted to be spontaneous and be in the moment. And so um, was that informed by budget? Probably, but then the budget informed my cr- the creative way I wanted to work, you know? So I never saw it as a limitation. I never saw it as a compromise. I just saw it as my reality. And, um, yeah. Um, I've got a question, actually. Uh, uh, do you guys want to talk a bit about uh, 
um, how it was working together, uh, how that uh, uh, maybe a bit. Um, people ask me like, oh, what was it like working your, with your mom? Was it so awkward during all the like coming of age type scenes? <laughs> and I mean, it was like in that in that way. To be honest, not really, because uh, it was sort of weirder, like, before we started shooting, being in Toronto, thinking about, like, reading the script and being like, oh, this scene, I'll have to do it, she'll be, like, three feet away from me and stuff like that. But um, by the time we got there, and, um, I mean, this is my, f like, first acting I've ever done, so I was just trying to be as professional as possible. And also, that was, like, halfway through the shoot. Um, that we were doing some of these scenes, and it was just, at that point, um, I don't know, it was just at a point in the shoot where it was just like, she was the director, and, and we were doing it, and that was just like my reality, and this whole, like the mother-daughter relationship kind of was almost like, I don't know, there wasn't really that much time <laughs> for a mother-daughter relationship during the shoot, so it was just kind of the way it was, and, um, and I mean, you know, occasionally there'd be a little bit of like, um, like maybe we would talk or like disagree the way a mother and a daughter would, not normally an actor and a director. But um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I was just trying to be professional and I think we kind of, we made it work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was risky, right? Because uh, I think she could have really hated me at the end of this experience. Uh, my whole family actually could have just completely disowned me because it's not, a, I mean, I try to make it as fun as possible, but A, um, working quite quickly and with very limited people power. B, I don't really know this family, family very well. I've met them four times and they said they would be a part of this film. My daughter, I asked her to do it. She certainly didn't ask me. And she said yes, and the actor, Alexander Gamal, who played Leko, um, was very enthusiastic but had no experience. And no one really knew what they were getting into. I mean, no matter how much I talked about it, no matter how much we rehearsed, no matter how much I tried to lay down and the, the, the groundwork for the technical um, kind of process, no one was prepared for the amount of repetition like with one camera in some of those group scenes, you know, I'm, I'm shooting singles, I'm shooting two shots, I'm shooting three shots, I'm shooting masters from maybe two angles. So my family is repeating the entering, the exiting, the lines 25, 30 times if I want more than one take, which I inevitably did because the first takes were usually very stiff and awkward. Um, that's like 35 times. They were ready to just kill me because um, you know the sun would be moving it was our key light sometimes we'd have 25 30 minutes there's no breaks for wine they all smoke like 13 packs a day there's no there's no breaks for cigarette you know I mean, it's just not gonna happen so or just getting my cousins out of bed because they you know if we want to shoot something before noon it was a huge deal uh, so I'd have to literally be like at the foot of their bed with you know, buns and espressos and, a, you know, a, 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 what is it, a carton of cigarettes, like bribe them. I just had to constantly be bribing everybody. Um, and they would give me, like, sometimes they would say, okay, you have a half an hour and then I got to go meet my friends or there's no way I can shoot today, I'm really hungover or um, after take three, forget it, I'm done, I need an hour break. And that line of, um, you know, being a family and tolerating and accepting and love each loving each other, but also trying to create this professional atmosphere of there's no way I can get on a plane and return home to Toronto without knowing that I have the material to, to make a movie because there's no going back for pickup shots. That's just impossible. So I had to know that I had the material to make a movie. Otherwise, I've wasted everybody's time. And I speak Slovak kind of at the level of a four-year-old. I mean, I left when I was two. 
I never studied. I've only spoken with my parents. So man, many, like almost everyone I dealt with in Slovak, in Modra, didn't speak English. So I'm communicating everything in English, then communicating everything in broken Slovak. They barely understand me. I'm losing the light. I'm speaking very fast. No one knows what I'm talking about. And action, you know? Um, another thing uh, that was, I guess, sort of a double-edged sword about us being like our real life relationship um, is that, yeah, sometimes things would move really quickly or scenes would change or get cut or like get completely rewit rewritten just like on the fly. And um, sometimes, and I think because we have a real life trust, I think that sort of translated because sometimes she'd be like, okay, the day's over, Hallie, you can go, you can go away. And then um, Matthew or Alexander would like, yeah, be like running. Hallie, wait, wait, we're gonna like completely reshoot something. Well, I don't know what this scene is. Yeah, yeah, she just wrote it. Or a, a scene would get completely changed, and I'd be like, well, I actually think you're making a mistake. Like I loved the scene the way it was, and so basically, I just had to like completely trust her sometimes, even if I thought she was making like a huge mistake in my mind, um, which was really hard. Like. Um, but, but yeah, so, you know, I would say, like, okay, the scene's being rewritten. I think that's a mistake, but, like, I trust you, and, and, and we can do it your way. So um, I think because, yeah, things did change a lot, the fact that I do trust her really, not just as a director, was, um, was helpful in that way. <laughs> yeah, and just one more thing about that, that, I mean, the shoot... Can I, can I talk about just, is, this is candid talk, right? Uh, the shoot wasn't so pleasant uh, on, on levels. And Hallie, I don't think, had as great a time as you, you thought you would. I mean, it was great to be with the family and to be, but it wasn't as fun as, as she thought. And um, there were a couple of days that were just really emotional uh, and and she wasn't feeling well, and she just was completely losing grasp of her character because I was changing things. And I knew, as a director, like the morning of the three crosses scene, when he's talking about you know muscle definition, he goes on to like name every muscle on his body, and that morning was a disaster. I was basically gonna throw away that scene. It wasn't working at all. And then we got into a really big fight, didn't we? Well, because I would say, mom my like my mom my mother like I'm feeling you know I'm feeling this way like I'm feeling really emotional you keep changing scenes like I'm feeling so much pressure I mean I understand that like if if I don't pull this off like it doesn't get pulled off and you know and and sometimes we have like three minutes to shoot a scene and I'm just feeling really overwhelmed and she'd be like this is good this is really good that you're feeling this emotion just hold on to this <laughs> hold on to the way you're feeling remember how you're feeling right now and we're gonna shoot the scene really soon so just hold on to this like anger and confusion and I'm like no like I really really feel this way and I don't want to shoot anything right now you know but yeah that was really hard thing as a mother going like, oh my God, I'm so, like, I just want to hug you. But as a director going, this is perfect. <laughs> this is perfect. How you're feeling right now that you you completely feel out of control and fantastic action, you know? So that was really, that was really hard. And that we're still friends through throughout all of that is, is kind of amazing. And um, the world premiere was Toronto and then we screened in Halifax and Vancouver and Calgary and we went to Sudbury and then we went to Germany and Bratislava, we won the audience award and I went with my mother who hadn't seen her brothers. Those are her brothers, the one that is like Slovakia's Neil Young, he plays with the band at the end of the film and the other brother owns the ranch. She hadn't seen them in over 15 years so she came with us and, and winning the award was fantastic. We went to Brazil and we're going to Manchester and to Italy and to um, a whole bunch more festivals. So we get this amazing travel experience in this gap year before she goes to university. She's going to the University of King's College in Halifax in September. And so also part of the festival touring has been checking out different universities and, and stuff like that. So now I'm just like, all right, you're baked, ready to go out in the world. It's been a pretty cool rite of passage. I recommend it to all of you. <laughs> okay, any more questions? I, there you go. Yeah. Question was about, uh, do you feel any anxiety when you're about to premiere the film? Oh my God. I like, I made a film, 
I remember screening it in Vancouver, and it was a short film, five minutes, with my friend Charles Officer. It's called Erda Bone. Um, and my ears, like, I just remember that they felt full of, I just couldn't hear anything. I, I thought I was going to faint. Like, I, my ears started kind of like that, not that ringing, but it was like I was underwater, and my mouth started getting really dry, and I just started really, really shaking. And the film was finished, and then I was supposed to go up for a cue, and I thought, it's going to be really embarrassing if I pass out up there. Like, I don't know what to do. And so I kind of ran down the stage, and I just went like this. <sighs> okay, you guys. I'm really sorry. And I was like this with the microphone. I was just like... <sighs> Okay, and my nose was running too. And I thought, oh God, they're gonna think I'm like a coke addict. But like, <laughs> I'm just nervous and my nose is running and it, things are happening that I'm not in control of. I do not understand what my body's doing right now, but it's flipping out. And uh, I could barely get through the Q&A. And I remember saying, I remember thinking, this is a nightmare. Like, am I ever gonna get better at this? Is it ever gonna get better? And it does, you know, but... It took me, I have to say, it took me a couple of years. Like, it took me, you know, I've had 11 films at TIFF, and the first five were absolutely terrifying. And I was always like this. I was just like, can you please, please hold the microphone? I'll just, I'll just talk in it, because I can't hold the microphone. Everyone's going to think I'm just like, I don't know what they're going to think, but it's not going to be, it's not going to, you're not going to feel like you want to work with me. Um, so it's, you just got to go through it. And, and what I try to do now is I try to go, I'm not nervous. I'm just really excited. This is a nervousness. I'm just so excited. And you, I try to flip the switch into enthusiasm and excitement as opposed to terror and, and nervousness. But it's just a practice, man. Like, yeah. I mean, it, feeling nervous is ultimately when that goes away it's kind of a sad thing like I still get quite nervous and I'm kind of happy about that because it means a you care you're passionate you um you've put you've got a lot riding on this you're you feel under pressure you feel anxious you want people to like it those are all amazing things like that means you're vulnerable and vulnerable is the most beautiful thing of all and when you lose that vulnerability you just become a robot you know it's not so interesting so as long as you're feeling that you're alive and and it's fantastic yeah i don't know the, the question was uh whether it was uh the whether the speakers actually sounded like that or whether it was like you know it seems kind of similar to the ttc announcements yeah that's cool isn't it uh no sheer coincidence they every announcement starts with that bing boom boom every single announcement also Yeah, and what was really good just um, is that my husband, her father, was the sound recordist, the one-man sound department. Uh, so besides her having anxiety about having both her mother and her father two, three feet away from her, and her father like with mega headphones on listening to every single breath, you know, like cringing when she, because she, when she eats, she bites her fork, and that really irritates him as a dad. So every time she bit her fork, he'd be like, Hallie, because he had to hear it magnified in his headphones. Um, but he was amazing at recording wild sound. He was amazing at waking up at dawn and going to the hilltop and recording the sound of dawn. He's a total sound nerd. Or, so he would wake, he would, on our days off, record those announcements. And he, I had tracks and tracks and tra tracks of wild sound that were that basically formed all the sound effects in the film and so the sound effects editor was ecstatic because the sounds of the birds the sounds of those cars with those mufflers the sounds of the engines the sounds of those announcements if i tried to cheat those you would feel it and i it's subtle but i think that those are all really authentic recordings from this little rural village in eastern europe um is, is, is really important and that's like credit to him because I, I would have been a big disaster in post if he hadn't done that. So when you're working with sound recorders, even though after a long day they're exhausted, get those guys who just cannot get enough of recording sounds. And they just, you know, he got a couple of Sony stereo recorders. They're like 400, you now you can get them for like 200 bucks. And when we went to a bar, when we went, when we were shooting any crowd scenes, he just would plant them on tables and just get the ambience of everywhere we went all the time. And your third? 
the HVX 200 Panasonic P2 camera. Yeah, uh, no film lights, like just three little inkies, otherwise just the sun. I think we gotta wrap it up. Uh, but so, I mean, do we? How much time do we have? Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh Steve. Um, he's talking about a sound package and, and he has, uh, you have two mics? Yeah, he had a shotgun, a four-track mixer, um, two labs, and we were essentially tied to the camera. Uh, the boom was tied to the camera 99.9% .9 of the time. That was his whole package. So um, I'll find out for you. Yeah, I have cards um, with my email, and so you guys can email me anytime, and we can become... Facebook friends and whatever and if you have like more specific technical questions about sound or anything to do with Anything else after this session you can email me and I just want to say also I do have buttons for more people if you want buttons You can have those too. Okay, sorry the, I was giving you that look because uh, you were doing sound things and I didn't know what the heck you were talking about uh, uh, You've had it right there. Yeah mm. Uh, the gentleman, the question was about the relationship with the cinematographer. You said it was quite spontaneous uh, uh, during the shoot, but what was the pre-production uh, work? How, how did you, uh, did you have a plan going in that way? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, he shot only. So we had done a feature previously together. So we did, you know, developing the language, like with a composer, a cinematographer, when you're working for the first time, can be... Um, a process, right? So when I say, I want this to be, I want this to go in and out of focus, I mean, th 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 like th th how the cinematographer translates that um, can really be very far away from what I actually mean. So we'd gone through a feature together and with Modra, I spent three months writing in the village. So I'd cleared all the locations. You know, I went around to all the bars and all the spots and talked to everybody and I, I showed him stills and he was always really adamant on, you know, point, like, show me where the sun is, show me what time it is. Um, and we talked a lot about just scheduling things so that he would have more than 20 minutes to shoot something. Uh, and we were really restricted because when the sun, you know, went behind a cloud, we had to stop or we had to, until it came out again, or we had to just kind of change the plan and decide the whole scene was going to be done in shade. And sometimes it looked like, okay, two hours, we're going to do shade. And then the clouds would break and then it'd be sun. And then, so we'd be, you know, abandoning, we'd be moving on to something else and coming back to that location. And so that was a spontaneous thing and, and flexible. But in the pre-production, we didn't really use references. Um, he, we both love the work of Gus Van Sant. Inspirations for me for this film were Cassavetes, um, especially films like Faces and uh, Minnie and Moskowitz was a huge inspiration. Um, so I wanted the, it to feel alive. I wanted the, the camera work to have an innocence as though it was I, I constantly told him I want it to feel like it's shot by a 17-year-old. I want it to have a kind of um, immaturity almost, you know? I don't want it to be refined. I don't want there to be a glossy sheen on the way the camera moves. So sometimes the pans seem a little bit shaky. I wanted it to feel like kind of amateurish, actually, because I wanted to, the whole film, the process, the point of view, um, the camera, I wanted to feel like it was done by a 17-year-old. And uh, we, um, Herzog is a huge inspiration. Um, I really wanted there to be humor. So, so Woody Allen was an inspiration. But when we were shooting, what was really good with him, A, he never rolled his eyes at me, no matter how crazy my idea was, no matter whether he got it or not, he was game. Um, so he never made me feel like I was stupid. So that, that was just so important too. Um, if we were shooting a scene and he'd be really fixated on something, but I would see something happening to the side, I would direct him, I would nudge him, I would whisper in his ear, I would sometimes, you know, really ungracefully tug on his sleeve. I would do whatever I needed him to do to move the camera to where I wanted it to focus. And 
he always went with me. He never was like, like, I'm loving this. I'm in love. This shot is perfect, you know? He just would con- sacrifice what maybe was going really well for him and go towards what I was sort of directing him to do and without hesitation. And that's, you know, because if you get a moment of resistance, sometimes the, the happy accident thing that's happening off to the side is gone. And I found the same thing with the actors, that they were so, I mean, there were moments before shooting scenes that they, my daughter, like Hallie would dig in her heels sometimes and like she said, she would vehemently disagree with what I wanted to do. But when we were rolling, they never resisted. So, I mean, they were really ready to fight in that fight scene. That scene was not scripted. And when we were shooting, I just thought, these guys have to fight because they we just got to blow the lid off. So I wrote that scene and um, Hallie was just like, yeah, let me at it. Uh, and while we were shooting, that was um, essentially one shot. Uh, and then we did a couple of sizes, but the camera never, the camera was moving, but you know, they were just against the windows there. Um, and in the middle of the take, I just said, slap him. And of course, she did not hesitate at all. Uh, but had she hesitated, or had he gone, whoa, what? Like, it wouldn't have worked. And another example of just people rolling with it and trusting and kind of surrendering and not resisting, not hesitating, even for that fraction of a second, was in the scene with the muscle definition. The whole scene was scripted, but not the part when he extrapolates as to what muscles. So while they were shooting that, um, I just said, like right out, out loud, I, I said, uh, ask him, well, I think the question, did you say where or what? Yeah, where. Where. So I just said, ask him where. And they both just stayed in it. She asked him where, and then he went into that whole thing. If they'd broken it for a moment, if she turned to me and went, what, or, uh, or anything, I wouldn't have had that. That's one, that's one, we got one chance at that. If, if, because it was a, an unexpected thing for him, she went with it and he was in the moment. So it takes so much trust and really like the editor, the sound recordist, the cinematographer, your actors, if there's not trust there, and d- trust doesn't come immediately. I mean, we had it and I think because we had it and I had it with my husband, it set the tone so that she was so willing to go with me, the other actor was willing to go with me too because he's quite competitive too. So he's kind of like, I can trust her more. Um, uh, so I, there, you know, that's really important. And I just want to, on your, on your question again, just with the DP, like this is an example of a rewrite. Like, so I was writing, the, this is the scene on the hilltop when he says, I'm really sorry about what happened. I just, I haven't been with a girl since grade 10. Um, I had another scene written and it wasn't working. And I said, okay, everybody, I did like a chaplain, you know, because I always heard about chaplains saying, okay, everybody take an hour. I'm going to think of something else. So I went, okay, I've got a crew of two people. Surely they're not going to be really pissed off if I say, okay, everybody take a break for 20 minutes. I'm going to write a new scene. And this was the new scene on the hilltop. And it literally was, these are your lines. These are your lines. Let's run it through. Shoot the rehearsal. And we've got five more minutes to shoot the scene. Go. Yeah. And with the cinematographer, um, he asked me for a list of words, right? And what did I, s- I mean, these are like, you know, somewhere between teenager and adult, high school and life, love and hate, home and elsewhere, present and past, acceptance and denial, the film should be about uncertainty, um, the limbo, the in-between, the gray zones. Um, I wrote this quote down, a challenging film goes where the solution and result are not yet known. I really like that. And these are my words with the cinematographer. I mean, I don't even know if this is how it ended up, but this is like two and a half years ago. He said, make a list of the words, the yes words and the no words. And uh, I thought that was really stupid, but I, they actually helped me. So the yes words were um, confused, variable, erratic, emotional, anxious, dense, engaged, layered. And I always had the song Helter Skelter in my head when I was writing. Um, And the no words were centered, square, simple, clean, thin, slight, detached, cold, observing, and consistent. Those were my no words. Those are the words I didn't want the film to be. But in the end, I think it's a very somewhat simple film. So 
you never know, right? But, but we did that. Um, and, uh, and then there was just a lot. I, I really respect him. So if he had ideas, um, he had ideas all the time. And my editor was with us the whole time, and he was assembling the daily footage, and we would frequently have powwows because sometimes the things that I'd imagined um, were simply not working, and I, there was evidence of it in the footage, and I had to respond to actually what was working. So without my editor there on location, I think it would have been really, really difficult. So the DP, um, everyone, everyone was just putting ideas into the pot all the time and then I was filtering and distilling and making choices and and starting the next day. We started with a plan but by day four, no one knew what we were shooting on any given day. It would be like wake up, we didn't have cell phones, so I would literally run from one house to the other, to the other, to the other, saying, you're wearing this, we're shooting here, we're kind of doing this scene, but maybe not, but maybe bring this other change of clothes, because we might shoot that too, and then running around, and then everybody would meet, and then we would go. Okay, was there somebody else at the back that I missed? Um, yeah, right there. Uh, question was uh, how, how the funding worked, and uh, how the uh, how the sort of do it, DIY, do-it-yourself aesthetic uh, enabled you to deal with a lower budget. Is yeah. that accurate? Um, having been a producer, I'm, I'm really aware of things that a distributor or a broadcaster will want. So I really look at that delivery list. And I could send you guys, I mean, I'm sure you, you have delivery lists. But I make sure I have money in the budget to cover for those things. And I basically funded it with four credit cards and I applied to Telefilm Canada's low budget program and they gave me money. Um, so that really afforded me a mix and a s very simple like kind of one light color correction, but a color, collection, color correction just to make the shots more consistent. Um, and a composer and you know all those things that you need to deliver all the master tapes and e and o insurance and all these things add up to like 10 to 20 30 40,000 dollars but i guess when i'm shooting i everyone signs a release um, you know, I did a title search on the film. I checked IMDb to make sure there was no film called Modra before i got too attached to it. Um, i didn't use any music in my temp score or whatever that I, that I knew I couldn't clear. All the music is essentially my uncle's band and the composer, um, original score stuff. So I kind of have developed a system of doing things, a scale that fits my budget, um, a system of paperwork that's really simple because I was, there was no PM, there was no AD, I had no assistant. So I'm clearing locations, getting them to sign. I'm asking people, you know, in the bar if they'll be in this shot and dance. This is actually on the back of the... Oh, that's the release, yeah. And I, I, I basically, oh yeah, I stole the letter, so they thought it was official. I just copied this letterhead, you know, so it's like Canada government, very official. Um, and then I just have like the film title and it's an all purpose release and I did it in their language, in Slovak, so they could read it really quickly. But it's just, by signing this letter, I confirm, oh, this is a minor one, but... Uh, I give my consent to being recording and edited for the use in the feature film Modra, directed by Ingrid Venninger. Um, I may or may not receive credit, and I give permission you know, for my use worldwide in perpetuity in all media, and no other person's consent is required. You know, just, and everyone signed it, and everybody that gave me a location signed it, and um, so I'm basically making a film that I want people to see that I ultimately want to sell. So I had my producer hat on all the time. Every day was like 35 to 40% producing duties, directing duties, and then just like making sure the family doesn't quit on me. Uh, cool. That, that probably adds up to more than 100% actually. Uh, uh, just in the back row there. Yeah. The oh, hey, question was about the, the shifting, uh, uh, sort of sh oscillating from the background to the foreground in terms of focus. Uh, and was it a particular scene or just in general as a principle? Oh, the scene in the playground, yeah. This week in their lives, um, 
maybe they're aware of how important it is and maybe it's just like a blip on their radar and when you step outside of that um i mean there's 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 so much more and it's kind of like yeah it's playing with present and past and and perspective of course and um you know i i i love i think it was norman wilner and now magazine said something like you know these two characters just experience this incredible week but it's a week but they don't they're not even aware of it you know they they will look back on this time when they're adults and they'll say that was really significant that was a girl i could have married but she just got away but they're not there yet so it's a little bit me the filmmaker kind of making you know kind of expanding the role a little bit because actually as characters i do think that they have changed in ways they're not really aware of yet but they're very very significant i mean going home to slovakia when i think of that trip now i mean it inspired this film when i think about the, that trip now it changed my life but in that completely self absorbed time of 17 i barely looked at a church like i didn't you know people say why aren't there more ceramics in the film because modra is so famous for ceramics and it really is i was like ceramics when i was 17 i didn't go in a ceramic shop i mean i was just thinking me myself ooh you know so uh so that's like a little bit me now looking back on 17 that trip was rocked my fa the foundation of who I am, you know, who I became, who the whole like it informed the so much of the journey of the rest of my life, but I was completely not aware of it when I was 17. So was what was the significance of the magician character? One thing that's interesting is that he was in the film for quite a specific reason. And it's parts of what you're all saying. And every time I watch the film, his role kind of changes based on how I feel. So in this way, I think it's cool that, you know, you may see him as really like a sad character. Someone else may see him as a really hopeful character, soulful, instilling faith, affecting her character, really not affecting anything. Um, and I think he's kind of a character that changes. He's almost a chameleon based on every individual that watches the film. Um, so let's just leave it at that.